Okay, here they come. People are joining us, that's great. Give everyone a couple minutes to join. Well, it's one o'clock, so uh, my name is Gay Jennings. I have the privilege uh, and honor of serving as the president of the House of Deputies, and I want to welcome all the deputies and alternate deputies who are joining us today from near and far for our second uh, House of Deputies webinar. So glad that you are here with us today. And it is a great privilege to introduce our guests Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs, Bishop of Indianapolis, and Bishop Dion Johnson, Bishop of Missouri, both former deputies um, who have spent time and know our house well. Uh, Bishop Jennifer is a native of New York City. She holds a bachelor's degree in architecture with a minor in urban studies from Smith College an MA in Historic Preservation for, uh, Planning from Cornell University, and an MDiv and Honorary Doctorate from the Church Divinity School of the Pacific. Uh, before Jennifer was elected Bishop of Indianapolis in 2016, she served in the Diocese of Newark, Central New York, my home diocese, and Chicago, and she is the first black woman to be elected a diocesan bishop in the Episcopal Church. Jennifer's experience and expertise includes historic preservation of sacred buildings, stewardship and development, race and class reconciliation, and spiritual direction. She's a very accomplished distance runner and triathlete and a passionate chef and baker. She and her husband, Harrison Burroughs, are parents to Timothy. Jennifer was a deputy from the Diocese of, the Great Diocese of Central New York in 2006 and 2009, and then again, a deputy from the Diocese of Chicago in 2015. Welcome, Jennifer. Bishop Dion Johnson was born and raised in a small, village in the Caribbean island of Barbados. He and his brother immigrated to New York when he was 14. He holds bachelor's degrees in English and history and an associate's degree in biology at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and an MDiv from the General Theological Seminary. Before Dion was elected Bishop of Missouri, in 2019, Dion served in the Diocese of Ohio and Michigan. I just have to note that he and I were together in a Fresh Start group in the Diocese of Ohio. So look what happens when you go to Fresh Start in the Diocese of Ohio. To his new role, he brings deep experience and passion and commitment to social justice issues and ministry to gay and lesbian communities. Today, he continues to serve on the task force for liturgical and prayer book revision, and as a consultant uh, to uh, or with the Office of Black Ministries. Dion enjoys cooking, photography, hiking, and being an armchair movie critic. Um, and he and his husband, Giovanni Osorio, are the parents of Lilo and Jalan. Dion was a deputy from the Diocese of Michigan in 2018. Again, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar. And now it's my pleasure to introduce somebody who doesn't need any introduction, uh, Vice President Byron Rushing of the Diocese of Massachusetts, uh, 
Byron will be the host for today's webinar. Byron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gay. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be with us all on this webinar this after, this, at this time. As we think about how we continue to renew the mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Well, this is so good to be with you uh, and to begin uh, a discussion that I think people are having in a number of places in our church right now. And that is a discussion about how do we relate to each other and how do we make decisions together. Since the beginning of the Episcopal Church, we have governed ourselves democratically with the full participation of lay people, clergy, and bishops. Many of us take that for granted, but no one took it for granted at the beginning of the United States, at the end of the American Revolution. No one took that for granted. And as some of you know, there was a huge set of arguments about how this group of, we call them Anglicans, but that's not a good historic term. They saw themselves all as Church of England, members of the Church of England. How in this new nation that had been so successful in opposing the King of England, how were they going to maintain an organization of their theology and what they considered essential in that theology? They had, of course, the prayer book, and they weren't going to give that up, though they certainly had to change it. Okay. And they, though, had also a deep influence of what had happened in the country. Now, I'm not sure what would have happened to our Episcopal Church at the beginning if we didn't have uh, the fact that a good number of our clergy who supported the king and were opposed to the revolution left. That certainly did help. Right? But when the smoke cleared, the majority of the, the what would become Episcopalians decided that they wanted a church not only that was connected to their understanding of their historic church, but was also new. And they wanted a church that was influenced by what they had been influenced by and that was an understanding that individuals should be able to participate and make decisions for themselves. Now, we will probably talk later in this hour about the fact that they had a very limited version, vision and definition of who those individuals should be, but they did know that they should be lay people and priests or they would call presbyters. And they came together and decided that they would form a denomination that had at its head no person, no one human would be the head of this denomination. This denomination would be headed by some representative body of everybody. And that 
head would be a group of people, a convention. And so they invented the idea of general convention at the same time that they were revising the prayer book and before they had an idea of where they'd put bishops. Now the other piece, of course, was bishops. And they came up with a very radical idea about bishops to go along with this idea of a convention. And that idea was elect them. They would not be appointed. And so all of these pieces come together and eventually we have, in a very few years, an organization of a denomination that was so importantly unique that it lasted. The fundamental pieces of that beginning were never changed. We never changed the idea of electing bishops. We never changed the idea that when we all got together, all the orders and lay people would be represented. Now, there were a group of bishops who wanted to meet by themselves. We had an argument about that, and that group of bishops compromised and won, right? And so we ended up with a bicameral legislature. And, but nevertheless, everyone who came to that general convention was elected by other people. No one came there because one person sent them. Now, that general convention, of course, went on to do a number of remarkable things. And I always try to think of the general convention as an invention that helped us be the church. That that group of people coming together from the very beginning, not only did the polity that I talked about, not only did the adoption and revision of the prayer book, but they went on to argue that we should be a missionary society. We should see ourselves as a church, as a missionary society. They went on to say that in our lifetimes that we should have a prayer book that included a very explicit set of vows at our baptism, which have become the popular, such a popular force in our church. And we figured out what songs to sing. We figured out what rules there would be about divorce and marriage. We figured out that ordination should be extended to women and ordination should be extended to LGBTQ people. All of those things came out of conventions. And that means that all of those things were argued about and all of those things were decided by people who had been elected to decide them. So I would like to uh, begin our discussion talking about how does this system of governance, which of course extends to dioceses and to parishes, how does this system of governments work for us now at this just incredibly difficult time? How does it work for us? And what should we, how should we best use it as we make our decisions about this virus and pandemic, and how do we use it as we make these decisions about this incredible recalling of people to the concern of racism in this country and other parts of the world? How do we use it? And so I invite my friends, Dion and Jennifer. Uh, I won't tell any stories about Jennifer. Jennifer and I go way back. 
<laughs> and so as and just invite you to sort of reflect on that and what direction um, because we are going to take this conversation is going to be directed by our, what our experiences have been over the past several months and in answering the questions of everyone who is on and wishes to ask a question. So, Jennifer? Well, uh, thank you. Um, I'll begin just by a word of welcome to all of those who are watching. I scrolled through the participant list at the beginning and was wistful to so many friends um, who I've served with in the church over the years and familiar names and longing for the time to be together with you all in person at some point. I'm thankful that Byron took the time to go over our history about how we got here, what is the beginnings of our church and some of the originating ideas, the foundational ideas and concepts that we do take for granted. Uh, D Bishop Dan and, I, Dan and I spoke yesterday, we thought, well, maybe we need to, you know, unpack this idea of democracy. What does it mean to have a democratic structure? But you've already, you've done that. And I would um, want to just elaborate on it just a little bit about what it actually means for us. As an adult convert to the Episcopal Church, I will say that I, um, I didn't bring another idea of structure with me. This was the one structure of doing church that I knew. And I remember knowing, though, very early on, when I took my formation classes, that it was important to know how we made decisions in this church. And um, lots of people would say, you know, this information that you just shared so succinctly, Byron, is essential information as we continue to grow our church, particularly with folks who are, who have forgotten that history or who haven't, who are new to the, our, our branch of the uh, Jesus movement. Um, the notion that what happens at general convention begins in the parish meeting. Like I had that hammered into my head because it really said that the ability for everyone to have a voice, which is the, um, the takeaway for this democratic structure, the ability for everyone to participate in the workings and councils of the church um, by some represent rep representational model um, meant that everybody actually mattered. When you come to your annual meeting and you elect a your delegates to your diocesan convention who then elect deputies to general convention or when you have an idea for a resolution that happens at your parish that it can sort of go up the food chain to actually enact policy that we might um, live and present through our office of government relations i mean everyone gets a voice and so the, what the democratic structure says to me for our church that has to be lived in every day and i stress this as one who now sits in the other house, House of Bishops, is that I assume collaboration. <laughs> like having a democratic structure means that there is a way for more voices to be at the table. And I assume that if we're going to be talking about things of import of any kind, like we have to have all the orders represented. So that there is in our structure baked in this assumption of collaboration the sense that no one order can be isolated. We may indeed meet separately. You know, we have a house of bishops and a house of deputies with um, presbyters and deacons and lay people, but we're not meant to be isolated from each other in these conversations or in our decision-making. We have to be, at the end of the day, finding what the common mind of the church is by being in conversation, um, knowing that we're bringing, as we represent our diocese or our congregations, that we, we are actually bringing the mind of all of those folks who have indeed elected us and trusted us with the responsibility of trying to discern God's will for our church and for our sensibilities about being trans agents of transformation in it. So, um, so that actually impacts a lot of the work we, at least the, the work I do, the work I see that um, it's important to do and how we do it. And I'll ask uh, Dion to speak about this in a moment, but how this looks in real time, in the time of pandemic, when we are having, um, you know, just all of the troubles highlighted that are at the root of our country's founding around white supremacy and racial violence and all of that, that if I want to figure out how to do something about that, how to respond, that it's a conversation I can't have in my own echo chamber. And so um, having a, what we call a sort of multi-diocesan cohort of bishops and canons is how uh, Bishop Deanna and I have 
start to address the needs and the um, problems of the moment by saying, I could just talk to the bishops in province five alone, or how about we gather bishops and lay people, canons, staff to troubleshoot and talk about how do we respond to the pandemic? How do we respond to the church's ongoing work around dismantling white supremacy? And so, um, Dion, do you wanna say a little bit more about what we've been up to? Sure, and thank you. Um, and thank you, Byron, for such a great introduction to this. We, we had gone back and forth about how we were gonna try to define um, the democratic and the way that we're using it. So thank you for doing half the work for us. <laughs> Um, for me, th th there are three words that come to mind, um, and Jennifer hit on one, collaboration, um, conversation. Um, I think that a big part of what we're talking about is the different orders in the church being in conversation with each other, um, that no decision is just made by one group, but that, you, that we have to engage with each other. Um, so there's collaboration, conversation, and then connection, um, that we're, we're all connected to each other and so, for instance, um, one of the things that Bishop Jennifer and I and a couple of the bishops um, and canons and lay folks that we get together periodically to have conversations around where we are in this current moment. Um, we first started off talking about how do we respond to some of the, <laughs> the novelty of the novel coronavirus. Um, and then we morphed into addressing some of the events that's happened since the death of George Floyd. Um, one of the things that came out of that um, is the anti-racism covenant um, that I was one of the, the one of the primary authors on, but not on my own. <laughs> there was lots of inputs from bishops, from um, clergy, from deacons, from lay folks, um, and so it really embodied those three C's of collaboration, connection, and conversation, um, where we met regularly to just talk about where we are and how do we address um, these seemingly unsurmountable um, mountains that we find in front of us, which is something that general convention seems to have a knack for doing, that we, we, we can go into it sometimes with some things that seem completely unsurmountable and we come out with um, a blessed and sacred compromise somewhere in the middle um, that respects and honors everybody's voice. Um, at our best, our, our democracy in, <laughs> in the Episcopal Church comes from the passing on of our baptismal authority so that those lay folks who are electing vestries and you know who are electing um, delegates to conventions and all that stuff they're in essence passing on a part of their baptismal authority to those folks that are elected who continually pass it on um, so when by the time we get to general con convention there is so much baptismal energy in that room that has been passed on I'm surprised that they don't issue like swim goggles and, <laughs> and, and paddles because we're all kind of swimming in a bunch of baptismal authority to get to general convention. I think that that's uh, such uh, an important um, way of talking about this. Uh, uh, and, and Jennifer has, I think, you know, it, those, as, as, as you know, um, politics, secular politics, was my primary mission um, and primary ministry uh, for a number of years. And one of the things that we always worry, have always had to worry about, is that people don't understand, don't see the structure as the end. You see, the structure is there to allow us to, to act this way all the time, informally and in small groups and big groups. And so when we talk about it, I love the way you put that, Jennifer, when we talk about democracy in the Episcopal Church, there is the structure of democracy that we have vestries and diocesan conventions and general convention, but there's also a kind of spirit of democracy that we all have to have because those structures really don't work unless we always say, oh, we should be talking to these other people. We should be talking. Every time we have a conversation, we should always be asking, oh, wait a minute, who's not in the room? Which Episcopalian is not in the room? Right? And, and, and always be uh, both aware of our formal structures, but also aware that we have uh, a, a kind of just 
uh, culture in the Episcopal Church of uh, being of, of doing that of being together and and talking together and making sure we're always talking together and not being afraid of arguments I guess is the other bit <laughs> in in that but we never have church fights what are you talking about <laughs> yeah. But so, Byron, what you remind me of, though, is that, um, you know, if you've been in the church for a little bit of time, you realize we talk about structure all the time. And I've gone a couple of rounds serving on the commission on the Senate Commission on Structure, Constitution and Canons, or, you know, whatever iteration it had, there was always structure in it. So I've been thinking about structure a lot. And yet I find myself saying that in this time of change, where that, that overused word from a couple of triennium ago, <laughs> nimble, you know, the, the need for our church to actually be responsive to a moment just like the one we're in now, where we can't wait until the next general convention, convention to talk about what to do. Like we need to be responding right now, which is why understanding that you have to have many voices at the table to be talking about it is, um, is that culture piece. It's the, this is how we do things. And what I notice is that it's easy for lots of us in the church, and I'll put myself in that camp, to get fixated on the structure of the Episcopal Church, meaning the big structure at the top, general convention, election of bishops. And I think there's a lot of work to be doing around diversity there, obviously. But if that's the only place where we're looking at it and looking for the, the uh, diversity of voices, then we are not doing the work. And that's the tension of our church right now, is that we, I think we do a good job with creating diversity in our House of Deputies, for instance, where the House of Bishops is becoming more diverse. But it's at the ground floor level and, and then everything in between where we have to be asking who's at the table, who's not at the table, who never gets access. And so we're talking about issues around race, around gender, around um, ableism. And those are things that you know we need not neglect as we think about how do we look at the um, the fullness of living into this structure of a democratic system like all the way up and so as bishop I, I i'm constantly scanning and going okay do we have geographic representation do we have um balance of you know where are the latinos at the table when we are talking about what something that doesn't have to do with spanish language ministry right that has to become a a way of life all across the church for it to really matter as much as I think our, um, you know, those of us who are serving now want it to. It just can't be at the top. It starts at the bottom and works its way all the way through for at our best. And I think that uh, that diversity um, is is of all sorts, you know, and 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 it includes also ideological diversity. And we have a question here from uh, Deputy Beresford from uh, Delaware, Ruth Beresford from Delaware. And she asks, the parish I serve is in the most affluent area of our state and diocese. And it's predominantly Caucasian and members range from progressive Democrat to very conservative Republican. From time to time, I receive comments from my conservative members wondering if there is still room for Republicans in the Episcopal Church. And they perceive an alignment of the Episcopal Church priorities with the platform of the Democratic Party. So years ago, I used to say we had members of all sorts, um, and, and, but claiming their faith, uh, even though General Convention had approved resolutions acknowledging other things like women's right to choose, and so how our resolutions and priorities encourage a mature Christian faith that proclaims Christ as Lord and allows our members space to take their faith into their understanding. And I think that that's, and that's certainly uh, an issue that has, I, I've not heard a lot about it lately, but certainly be, uh, uh, four years ago, there was a lot of, of discussion about that in our, in our churches. Uh, and, and, and before I get you started on this one, um, let me let me just say that of course, from from again a nice history point, uh, none of us we were alive then. But in 1900, of course, that was one of the nicknames of the Episcopal Church 
was the Republican Party at prayer? Right. Well, I, I, there's several places where this one can go. <laughs> um, I'll speak a little bit to the almost our secular culture, if you want to call it that. I mean, it's a culture that we're all enmeshed in. Um, one of the things that has happened, in, in, in my view, is that we've we've all created our. We're talking a lot about bubbles lately in pandemic. You know, your family bubble, um, and in a sense, we've created quite a few ideological bubbles. Um, where we can quite easily get into an echo chamber of people who I think who think or act or are just like me um, ideologically. Um, We've also gotten into a place of individualism where it's it's about me rather than about us collectively. Um, and so I, I think what ends up happening a lot of the times, especially when it comes to the issues of Republican or Democrat or whatnot, is that we've, we've been talking so much among ourselves that we don't know how to talk to those who might be in a different opinion. Um, we talk at other people but we don't do a very good job talking to each other um, and sharing stories and being intentional about making sure that those voices that we disagree with are at the table. Um, one of the gifts of some of our structure is that those voices, whether we agree with them or not, have to be at the table. Um, when we come to general convention or um, even the convention of a diocese, you know, those multiple voices show up. Um, and to me, that's part of the gift that the Episcopal Church brings. Um, my grandmother um, <laughs> growing up used to say, uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and I think in some ways we are learning or we're, we're having to relearn what it means to disagree without being disagreeable um, in the midst of all the chaos that's happening um, outside of our, of our church bubble. Um, I think if nothing else, the church is called first to be at that place of reconciliation. Um, and reconciliation begins with a naming. Um, the preacher at my consecration ordination said something about telling stories and telling the whole story. Um, and so you know, be, being able to tell the whole story um, brings us into that place of beginning the work of reconciliation. And I think ultimately that's what the church is called in this time. In this time of polarization and division, we are called to bring that sense of reconciliation, um, that forgiveness, that being made one um, for, for the time that we find ourselves in. Yeah, and Dan, I wonder too about, um, you know, the recent phenomenon that of that's in social media about cancel culture you know <laughs> that um that's before we had that phrase has been playing itself out over the last number of decades i think in our country and it, and i think i mean i experience it like this um i don't agree with everything you agree with in this set of beliefs and so i'm done and i'm walking away you know, I, I was telling the story last week of a clergy friendship I had that ended with one conversation over the sexuality debates in the early aughts. Basically said, we have nothing left to talk about and I've not spoken to her again. It's 16 years ago and I still feel that, that hurt because she couldn't even, you know, we're done. And so the idea that we have to accept every single belief <laughs> and ass assent to it in its entirety, or we can't be a part. Like, so, yeah. so that, because that's not possible, we no longer, we've lost the, um, the bandwidth to have a sense of what it means to be a part of a collective, whether that collective is a congregation or a city or a country. And so if I think of myself politically as a Democrat, I could never say to you that I've ever agreed with every single um, pillar of the Democratic Party, right? I just, it's unrealistic to believe that. And yet we hold that standard to a lot of other places, including the church, where it's, um, we've lost the ability to be able to think about it. Maybe we never had it, but people were silenced about it. You know, there were black folks in the Episcopal church before the Episcopal church was on the right side of slavery, <laughs> right? But <laughs> folks didn't say, I'm not, I'm, I mean, some folks left, but it wasn't like this thing because there, there were other things that held 
people together. And now we're in this place where we want to have those voices lifted up. We want to be able to have our faith dictate um, more publicly our choices uh, for church, for society. And I, I just wonder um, if looking at them, well, what do I need that's enough for me to say I'm still with you, even if the choices that we're making are different ones that now I might personally choose, because for the whole body, it brings us to a better place or a different place, you know? So I, I'm still wrestling with how that puts together, but I just think there's something around bandwidth and yeah. the ability to understand that we actually are all in this together, but being all in it together doesn't mean that we agree on every single thing the same way. Yeah, I, I think a part of it is leaning into the current moment and leaning into the, the stuff. I mean, I, I'll give a very brief example. Um, there's a congregation in our diocese, in my diocese, that, um, <laughs> disagrees with me on several points. <laughs> um, you can guess probably a couple of them. Um, and, you know, they were upset with probably some, something that I said. Um, and so I made a point of setting up a Zoom uh, town hall with them so that we could be in conversation, that we can talk about it. Um, and by the time we were done, we didn't agree any more on the issue but they had a better sense of me and I had a better sense of them. And, you know, by the time we were done, they invited me down to, you know, we're going to do a tour of the town and have food when this is all um, done. But we yeah. didn't have to agree. <laughs> we, we, we could just agree to have the conversation. And I think in a lot of places, that difficult conversation, that leaning in um, could be very helpful. <laughs> So now you're going to get me going on fierce conversations, right? Like, <laughs> of <course>. <laughs> because <laughs> it's enrich like you don't have to come out of the conversation in agreement, but you mm -hmm. learn something, you enrich the relationship. And so that bandwidth piece is that it's a, it's relational. You know, when we understand that being in relationship is more important than being right on every score, we can be in a really different place and have a different church, have a different country. I mean, it's, those are some essentials, but, um, I, I don't think we've even taken the time to understand that that's something that's necessary. And I'm experiencing this pandemic time as the time when because we are not commuting, we're not, you know, we're sheltered from one another in different ways that we're actually having conversations about race and dismantling um, white supremacy in ways that I don't think were possible where we're not in a pandemic, honestly, yeah. because there's a different kind of relationship building that's actually possible when we're not racing around within an inch of our life just trying to get through the day. We have other challenges by the pandemic to be sure, but I do think there is some time and space to reflect and to really look at what's in front of us and who's in front of us that's shifting how we have these conversations. Deputy Devon Anderson of uh, Minnesota asks us, where do each of you see points of connectivity between general convention and faith communities on the ground. One enriches the other. Where do they touch, overlap, inform, inspire each other? I'll throw an example and maybe hopefully this gets at it um, because it's a, it's a, a through line. So, um, Byron alluded to, and, and also Gay alluded to my roots in central New York you know, we, out of the little Syracuse metropolitan area, the three of us have come. And, um, and because the Syracuse area sits on the Onondaga Nation territory, you know, for, my, for me, that was where I first began to understand the importance of the doctrine of discovery and repudiating that, which we brought to General Convention in 2009 for the first time. And I remember it being a live issue because I had a member of the church I was serving in Syracuse who was a lawyer working with the Onondaga Nation on a land rights issue. And there are always land rights issues between the Oneida and the Seneca and the Onondaga there. And she said to me, as I was going to general convention, presenting this resolution with a couple of other dioceses, that it was critical to her case law that she was working on that we have the church make this resolution. So um, this is Thane Joyle, who um, is renowned in her work there. And so it was like, this is not, um, you know, a theoretical exercise. This has real import for people I live with in my community and not just here, but across the country. So that resolution made its way, it passed. And um, 
I continue to hear about it in the news nationally in other states like the doctrine of discovery and that work that rested on our church being able to say some things about that at general convention continues to play out to this so this is 11 years later and it'll probably continue to do so because the church talked about it they named it <laughs> they did some history um, historical research on it we said a thing about it and now it continues to make a difference in the lives of real people on the ground some of whom are in our churches and some, some of whom are not. It doesn't matter. This is about transforming the world beyond our um, composition of membership. And so that's where I get excited about the place of our convention making a difference um, at every single level of, of um, where we live in this country or in our church. And no, it's not just the United States, but for this piece, it was pretty central to um, the US presence of Native peoples. And that, and that is the way that we don't usually, uh, we actually don't put it on the list of the things about general convention. One of the things, of course, about general convention is having those debates and discussions. It also become a source for information for the rest of the church. Because, of course, they had to go back and say, what was it that we just voted on for a lot of people mm -hmm. who hadn't thought about it? We became a source uh, for education for the whole Episcopal Church, which I think is really exciting. Dion, did I cut you off? Oh, no, no, no. I was, I was going to say one of the um, interesting pieces in all of that is, is our liturgy as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. That happens to be my thing. So, um, but no, our, our, our liturgy really does go both ways, both from convention down and from parish level up. Um, right now, we are in the process of, uh, I'm on the, prayer book, the task force for liturgical and prayer book revision. Um, and we're in the process of collecting liturgies that are already existing outside of the norm of the prayer book or the 79 prayer book um, to be included or to be fi to figure out how those make their way into, um, into the official rites of the church. I mean, a perfect example um, are Latino sisters and brothers um, have quite a few liturgy, quinceaneras and um, other liturgies that that are filtering up that we're recognizing that um they're part of the life of the church um and so i mean some some of those liturgies have made their way into the book of occasional services and whatnot um but then there's conversations about if if we're if we're truly being a diverse and representative church um and the prayer book is the as both a theological and a liturgical document um it needs to be influenced by the folks who are actually on the ground um, and so, you know, the experience of Black African American folks being reflected in that prayer book, the experience, I mean, the biggest diocese I think right now is Haiti. Um, so making sure that that diversity that's in the church itself gets represented in the documents that represent who we are and how we pray. Um, and so I think that, that that's another place where you get some influence on both sides. So I think that uh, this, this, this question of actually how do we talk among ourselves uh, is, is, is really resonating in, the, in, 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 in many of the people who are, on, who, who are on this webinar right now. And we have a, a, a question from uh, Deputy Rachel Nyback. What about when the voice we disagree with are, are voices that are oppressing other people. What do we, what about the voices in our church which are oppressing other people? Right, so that's where the conversation piece comes in, right? Where I think one of the, uh, the conversation I'm having a lot right now around why are we talking about white supremacy so much? And I don't even like that term, it's divisive. It's because, um, We've not even acknowledged that we're, we're in the same, you know, conversation about that. <laughs> you know, I just, I mean, to be careful here, but I, I think one of the most important things that we have to do is to say that if you're going to really call everyone beloved <laughs> and say <laughs> that everyone's got a voice, that that has real life implications for people who have not been challenged about what their complicity or, um, or just, 
sense of omission have been in terms of making the, that, re, that a reality. So what we're seeing now, I think every single day is that we've been saying that not everyone has been treated beloved and we're showing it to you in real time. Let's now shift that conversation. I think that's the, that's an ongoing piece of work. And so I don't want to excuse people who are being oppressors, obviously, but I do think that um, a lot of the work is to help highlight what, what has been for a very long time understood of just the way we do business, the way we do church, the way we do society has not been shown up for the ways in which it's actually been um, slowly killing people or oppressing them or reducing their ability to flourish as we might want all people to flourish. And that's a hard conversation to have. And because we don't, we have a lot of other things to do just to get through the day, I think the church has said, well, let's just worship and be together and not talk about it because it's going to rile up a lot of difficult conversations that take time. <laughs> and now we're, I think we're at the point where that's not good enough anymore. And yeah. so there's no one magic bullet to make that or to shift that quickly. But I think it's the ongoing steady work. And so, you know, I, I could talk about how the pandemic has given us some opportunities to have conversations because we've got a, a bit of um, reflection time in some ways that are an unexpected um, thing from this time. But I also think the church has been talking about this for a long time. And it's, it's in the aggregate, it's additive. We didn't start this conversation a year ago or 10 years ago. This has been an ongoing piece of how the church lay and ordained has been trying to chip away at issues around injustice and who's at the table and who's oppressing whom. And now there are things that people would have seen as, you know, on the side 60, 40 years ago, which are now quite central. When I hear people talk about, um, let us not, you know, quoting Ed Rodman, <laughs> let us, you know, <laughs> not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. oppression, right? And I'm going, well, that's become common. I mean, we're, you know, Where did that <laughs> that's a shift because we've been doing this. And so, I don't know, Rachel, that kind of gets at it for you. But I, I think that's what I would say is that it's, um, it's the conversations of those three C's, I think, that Dion um, mentioned at the beginning that help us to highlight those places where the oppression is happening and then to, to be able to act instead of just thinking we can't do anything about it and sitting by. I would I would add to what Bishop Jennifer said, being able to see. Um, I think in a lot of ways, folks are beginning to see um, in a new way. Um, I've been using the image of Jesus healing Bartimaeus. You know, Bartimaeus was the one that was healed, but it was the crowd that actually saw. Because before then, the crowd couldn't see Bartimaeus. They, could, they didn't even acknowledge that Bartimaeus was even there. Um, he was just a blind guy, part of the scenery. And until Jesus actually, Jesus saw him, um, gave him some dignity, healed his blindness. But I think Jesus healed the blindness of the people around as well that they could actually see. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think that's what's happening in our, in, both in the church and in the wider society, that we are now being given new eyes to see um, and sometimes, you know, when Bartimaeus gets healed, Bartimaeus would prefer his, would prefer his blindness <laughs> because it means that, you know, his livelihood is now gone. Um, and so th there's pushback from folks about not necessarily, you, you can't unsee in a sense. And so what, what, what's being, what's happening is that we're, some of what's been happening in the church is, is now being revealed. Um, and Sometimes you don't want to see what's there. Yeah, I also think too, I mean, we've, the baptismal covenant, which we often like to say, oh, the baptismal covenant, which is a, you know, it's, it's, it's actually more radical <laughs> <laughs> yeah. than we, we um, might have thought about it years ago, right? And I think to the extent that there has been preaching about what that really, really means and talking about it and being formed in that, I think that's, that makes a difference. And so, you know, there are different questions that are raised. And I think the role of the church is to set a container where there is enough safe space to struggle with how hard it is to actually live into that covenant, mm -hmm. right? Like being a Christian is not easy. And so to the extent that we have ever thought that coming to church was the most comfortable thing we can do, <laughs> that meant that we were not actually raising up a mirror or saying anything mm -hmm. about these oppressions, right? Because 
good Work Christians, if it's uncomfortable. good Episcopalians, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I'm I'm actually gratified that the that we we have taken away the out, and this is you know looking at how I see people preaching in the pandemic. I can go to like lots of different church services now that I didn't always. <laughs> you know, I can see them online or participate, and so I remember a few years ago, folks saying if I preach the gospel you know, it gets, it gets partisan or it gets pushed, people get uncomfortable and I don't know what to do. And it's still like preaching the gospel is a risky thing always, mm -hmm. right? It's, it should terrify us a little bit. And I think that um, more folks are taking that risk because it's, we're, bec we're actually, um, I don't know, I'm just sensing a clarity or just a less, a sense that it's, um, rather than being afraid of preaching the gospel, like that's taking a back seat to being afraid to the, um, the, the thing that happens when, we, when we're silent. We don't actually call out the things that Jesus would have us name. And the, 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 um, the costs of not really being Christian and living into that covenant are so high, like in not doing it and we're seeing it. I think it's calling us out as a different church. And, um, and I say this for people, not just those who are ordained, but like everyone's got a sermon to preach about that. Like that's the work of the baptized. And we're claiming that in ways that are really powerful and encouraging right now. Thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs> From uh, Deputy Diane Wright, I wonder how we can change the structure of convention so more working lay people can participate. This time of pandemic provides opportunities for experimentation to reduce costs and increase participation. We're seeing that with diocesan conventions going online. Yeah, I, I'll jump in to begin with a bit of that. Um, part of what I've been saying to our diocese is that we're not going back to how things used to be. Um, the good thing is you can't go back. This, this time of pandemic has revealed to us that a hybrid world is, is pretty much where we're gonna be going, um, mm -hmm. regardless of you know, vaccine or pandemic or not, we are realizing that the way that we've always done things is radically changed. Um, and so I, I suspect, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but I suspect that that will influence how General Convention does its work going forward as well. Um, we may see more virtual hearings that allows a lot more people to be in um, in, in hearings. We might see more um, virtual presentations that allow for both in person and online. Um, but I think what's happened is that technology has shown us that um, in a lot of ways, the ways that we've continued to do things um, can be done in a different way. I don't want to say better, um, but in a different way. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of history, so I look back at history and the most creative and innovative and um, inventive period in our history as human beings happens after events like this. You know, if you look at the Black Death in Europe, it was followed by the Renaissance, where the, the biggest and best minds came to be. Um, and I suspect that following this time of pandemic, we're gonna see a level of creativity and innovation. I mean, that's already happening. I mean, think about this. Most of your clergy have suddenly gone from, you know, going to a building to being a televangelist on Sunday morning um, with really good production values and cool music. Um, <laughs> in a matter of, what, six months? I mean, if you had said to someone at the last general convention that the Episcopal Church would be on Facebook and YouTube and Vimeo and all kinds of streaming platforms, and that the daily office would be a big thing and that virtual convention would be happening, you probably would have been laughed off the floor of general convention 2018. <laughs> but look what's happening. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I think it gives us the opportunity to be very creative and innovative in how we move forward um, with general convention and diocese conventions and the gatherings of the church. And I, th I think that's really important, Dion, and, 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 and I like uh, that connection um, between these, you know, just huge tragedies, um, you know, and, and then the creativity that follows it. And I think that it's important, um, and I know that everybody, you know, we, we want in our minds 
to, to have a sense of what's going to be happening a year and a half from now. But part of this is that we don't know, right? And that, and that we have to sort of live into not knowing and live into preparing for uh, it, it, it being different. And, 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 the, and so as, as flexible as we can be is really good, <laughs> right? I, you know, it's just like, I, I assume that, you know, that most, that, uh, most of the churches uh, in your diocese, if they're like Massachusetts, have already said that they can't imagine not having, right, Zoom, yeah. something, right? There'll, all, there'll, all, there'll be some Zoom when everybody gets back together in, in person, but there's, yeah. But there's so many advantages that people have seen that they don't want to give up. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I can tell you one of the best days of my, my being Bishop life um, in the three months that I've been doing it <laughs> was at a visitation where an 85 year old lady scolded me and said, make sure that we keep this, you know, live streaming <laughs> and Zoom together because we're not, we're, we're not going to do this how we used to. And I, I, I was happy to take that scolding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that gets us up and talking about that that future. We do have this question from uh, uh, Deputy Thomas Alexander from Arkansas, warning us to predict um, and say what. And his question is, what do you hope the 80th General Convention will be remembered for? Well, first of all, congratulations, Thomas. Um, I think you just got married a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, I think Thomas, Thomas and I served on the prayer book and liturgy um, committee at con convention 2018. Got it. Um, what would the 80th be remembered for? Um, I think that we'll, we'll be remembered for the, the, the convention that, I don't wanna say changed, that helped the, the Episcopal Church evolve a bit further forward into its future. I think it'll be pivotal in figuring out what the next normal for our church looks like. That would be the short answer. Uh, well, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I can't help but um, think that the Holy Spirit has obviously been with us in a powerful way. Every time I think about what the three priorities of the Episcopal Church are right now, evangelism, racial justice, and creation care. And I mean, as we go into our general convention, like every single one of those issues is at the forefront, forefront. like right in front of us. How are we helping to shine the light of Christ where we go? How are we addressing the issues around climate change? How are we working to dismantle um, systemic racism and to create pathways for reconciliation? So. We could not, I mean, this was said a few years back, and yet here we are. So I, I hope our 80th convention is going to be remembered for getting as many voices in the room as possible, if only to listen in, right? So like there's the work of the, the, the houses, but more participation can be made available or to at least be kept in the loop because of this technology and the facility we have with it. And that I expect that we'll be making some... Um, We'll be doing some work of great consequence. You know, the work that we enable through our Office of Government Relations is going to be pivotal coming out of this convention because the, the very planet is wrestling with all of those issues in some way. And so I hope that we're going to be remembered for having broadened our participation and engagement and, um, and that on the other side of it, then we'll have continued depth of clarity about how to re enable ourselves to respond to those, those areas of concern. Deputy Carol Maddox asks us, how does the Episcopal financial structures mirror or not our embrace, both of democracy and our seasonal covenant, valuing every child of God? Our current structures seem to reinforce the status quo of rich parishes staying comfortable and poor parishes continuing to struggle. I think I, um, uh, go ahead. I, 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 I guess, defer. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a complicated, <laughs> yeah. Although I will say that um, 
one way I would approach the answer is that everyone is now more in touch with the common struggle that we all are living with, right? So in our diocese in Indianapolis, one of the ways in which we're trying to move through this time of pandemic is to say that every congregation is now in some position of struggle. Like, you know, the sense that some are more comfortable because they have more of a cushion financially than others or, you know, whatever the circumstance is. And we're like, well, yes, but actually we're all hurting. And let's talk about what that really means mm -hmm. and think about how do we, those who have some more means, give a little more or stay steady and others who need more help receive that help and to begin to um, understand what it really means to be a collective as a diocese, that our, our futures and our fortunes are so tied together that we can't afford to just have some struggling more and continuing to um, keep on struggle versus those who can sort of skate by a little bit more comfortably. Um, and so that's, again, that's work. I mean, we just spent some time calling dozens of congregations in the diocese one-on-one -on -one and meeting with their vestries to talk about what it means to redistribute the, the load here as we seek to find some financial um, equanimity. It takes time. <laughs> it takes some concerted effort for people to show up and on Zoom for yet another meeting because we're, it would be really easy for me and my staff just to make a decision to say, you know what, this is a time of pandemic belt tightening and so we're gonna just decide a thing and then let you know what we've decided. And instead we're like, no, we need to actually back to our democratic process, engage the lay, laity and clergy in the congregation to say, here's the situation, here's what we propose to wade through. Are you on board? Can we do this? And then we'll continue as we look at our budget process to, to um, talk about what that means in, in numbers. But um, the days of just saying, the bishop said, and y'all just say yes, like we just can't operate that way. So this, that pertains to everything, including how do we get through the struggle that's gonna be with all of us for a long time, even if it's unequally experienced. But we've all gotta know about it and we all have to play a role in trying to even things out. Yeah, we've been experiencing a bit of that here um, in my diocese and the, the, the language that I've been using is, and the pandemic kind of highlights it, we are all one church in many locations. Um, that it's, we, we have to get past the, it's my congregation and we have to get into, this is us together. Um, how do we benefit and how do we help and benefit each other rather than trying to take care of my one little piece of the pie? Um, and what it means though is that our financial priorities are going to have to be realigned to the places where as a collective, as a group, as the diocese that we come up with of this is where we want to go and this is how we want to be. Um, it also means that we have to come up with some new ways of being. Um, I always found it interesting that, you know, you have a lone parish, but Jesus sent us out two by two. Um, what does it look like to do collaborative leadership, collaborative um, ministry with a congregation next door or down the street, you know, and, instead of, <laughs> instead of seeing, you know, the parish that's seven miles away as competing for the same folks, um, what if we looked at that parish as our partner and we do things together? We blend our administration, we blend our youth and young adult ministry together. Um, I, I think that that's, that will have some significant financial impact um, and, and on the church because it means that we're gonna have to put our, our dollars where our priorities happen to be. So I'm looking at my Ah, I'm getting one more last question. <laughs> so. so I think that we are. Ah, uh, and this gets back to, is an excellent question and, <clears throat> and uh, this continues on our use of technology. And, and the question is, what are you doing to make sure that the, the, tech, that, that the technology that we're using is available to everybody? And do you have, do you have examples from your diocese of what, of what you're doing uh, uh, to make sure that this technology is available to everyone? Well, I, 
this is where um, being in Indianapolis is a, a particular blessing. So we have something called the Center for Congregations, which is a resource to congregations of every uh, stripe here in the state of Indiana. And as early as, um, it must have been early April of this year, they began to put out a, a grant application for technology grants. And so every congregation of any size could apply for a few thousand dollars to update their Wi-Fi access, to get um, a, whatever they needed to be able to live stream services or to record them. And many of our, I think maybe a third of our congregations applied for those funds in order to help um, make possible the worship that they were hoping to do over this time of shelter in place and beyond. So we're really blessed in that. I think what, had we not had that resource available to us as a diocese, we would have had to sit down and think about how do we shift some of our resources in order to make those kinds of um, financial supports for technology possible. We, we have places in our diocese where for geographic and geological reasons, the internet is spotty. Can't do anything about that. The, can't move the mount, mountains, <laughs> despite what the psalmist says. So we, you know, we we, uh, <laughs> we do what we can, though, wherever possible, <laughs> to make it um, accessible. Because that's you know becomes core. If we can't communicate, if we can't reach out with each other in the time of pandemic, then we can't do any of the other things we've been talking about around transformative ministry. Yeah. Well, I, I'd add to that. Um, one of the things that just this Saturday, our diocesan council passed a resolution or passed some funding that all the congregations in the diocese here can um, apply for money to help off offset the costs of technology upgrade. Um, because like I said, we, we, we realize that we're living in this, we're going to be living in a hybrid world and it makes sense to invest money in that type of stuff. Um, we're also in the process of figuring out doing a significant upgrade to our cathedral um, that if parishes aren't able to, we at least have a central location that everybody can tune into. Um, but every meeting that we have, and we have a lot, I have a lot of Zoom meetings, um, we make sure that the call-in number is available and we've invited congregations, especially the more rural ones, that even with safe distance and everything, that if someone does not have access at home, that our churches could become hubs um, for, for technology that you can come have your Zoom meeting at the church, that you could try to do some of that stuff. Um, because we are, we are living in this, in a virtual world in many ways right now, but once it's over, we're gonna be living in a hybrid world. Um, and there, there's, you know, once you've seen Paris, there's no going back. <laughs> this, has been, this has been so good. I wanna thank everyone who participated. I wanna thank everyone who uh, asked questions, um, and uh, I've, been, I've been going on a little bit uh, uh, to the chat room, and that's been fascinating. And um, so I, this has really be, been, been very, very, very exciting. And I wanna just come back to something that both J Jennifer and Dion said, and that is if we are serious about this wonderful gift that we've been given, uh, in the Episcopal Church about taking democracy seriously. We all have to do it. We all have to participate in it, not just formally, but, but in all of our work together and communication together at all the levels of the Episcopal Church where we are. Uh, so it, it has been so good to have Dion and Jennifer with us. It's always good to, to talk to them and I was, uh, I was very disciplined. I told no jokes about them. <laughs> I'm looking forward uh, to continuing this conversation in the many ways that are, of course, now available to us in this virtual world. And now if I could turn this back to our president, Gay Jennings, to uh, send us away from these rectangles. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Byron, for moderating this, and thank you, Bishop Dion and Bishop Jennifer, for uh, giving us your time and your energy and your insight and your wisdom. It's been a valuable uh, use of our time, and I'm most grateful. I just want to remind the deputies that the next webinar, the next House of Deputies webinar, will be November 12th at the same time, one o'clock, 
Um, and we do that to accommodate as many time zones as possible. And that seems to be the best time. Uh, and we will have Professor Scott McDougall of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, where he is a professor of theology and the newly appointed theologian to the House of Deputies, who will be talking about the theology of our polity and governance. So I think it'll be a fascinating conversation and I look forward to welcoming you in November. Thank you all. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God.